All right. The persecution of John the Baptist. Chapters 11 and 12 are all about Jesus facing opposition. We begin with John the Baptist in prison. John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and says, Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Why is John the Baptist asking Jesus, Are you he who is to come? Well, I've heard some theories that, you know, once John the Baptist, you know, got sent to prison, that his, his faith wavered and he started being unsure and started wondering, well, if, if, if Jesus is the Messiah, well, why am I sitting here in prison? I'm his cousin. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the one who prepared the way of the Lord. What am I doing here? That's probably not the case. Because Jesus doesn't say to John's emissaries, tell John, O ye of little faith. Yeah. No, that's not John the Baptist. Jesus goes the other direction. He says John is the greatest of all the prophets of the Old Covenant. So why is John the Baptist asking Jesus, you the Messiah? That really might be the main reason. Because John the Baptist talks about, you know, I must decrease, he must increase. But still, the, the end of the mission of John the Baptist, it's a strange one. John has these passionate followers. And now John gets to tell them, stop following me. My time is over. He's the one you need to be following. I think there's a couple of things going on here. I think John wanted to know, is it time? Is it time for me to send my disciples over to you? You know, and tell me, and tell me straight out, you know, I believe you're the Messiah. I've heard them, you're, that you're the Messiah. Tell me straight out. I'm in prison. I haven't seen what's been going on. I've been out of commission. Tell me what you're doing. Tell me, how's your ministry? Tell me, have you proclaimed yourself as the Messiah? Jesus quotes the book of Isaiah, just one verse of Isaiah after the next, where Isaiah is talking about the Messiah and his answer to John. Go tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor has good news preached to them. Jesus is saying, wink, wink, yes, I'm the Messiah. Go and tell your followers. But no, there's a big story there where you get... Uh, how John the Baptist railed against King Herod for his marriage to his, uh, his brother's wife. Right, right. Yeah, and how she got him arrested. So, yeah, there's a lot more to the story that we get in other Gospels. Yeah, there's no reason to think Jesus was with John the Baptist at the time. Um, some of Jesus' disciples were disciples of John the Baptist first, but Jesus himself was never a follower of John the Baptist. Sympathetic, you know, relative, same mission for the same God, but Jesus never traveled with John as far as we know. And he didn't know that he was, John didn't know that Christ was. And that's why we say that John had to know he was the Messiah. He introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, I'm not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. You know, he, yeah. John, John knows he's the Messiah. So say. then the question is, I think, is it time? You know, are you, are you proclaiming yourself the Messiah? Are you in ministry? Are you making it public? Yeah, making it public. What's going on? All right. Here we go. Um, Jesus praises John the Baptist, saying he's the greatest of all the prophets. He is the Elijah who is to come. And then Jesus laments the hard-hearted people of his generation. He compares them to sullen children who refuse to play because it's not the game they wanted to play. <laughs> Jesus says, we piped to you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. It's like wedding music and funeral music. John the Baptist is the wailer who calls on people to mourn their sins. Jesus is the piper who brings the good news of salvation. The bridegroom has arrived. It's time for the wedding feast. Yet, this generation remains strangely unmoved. They say John, who fasts and does penance, is demon-possessed, while Jesus, who goes to weddings and dinner parties and uh, is friends with everyone, is a glutton, a drunkard, and a friend of sinners. Jesus' generation isn't holy, 
They can't even admire holiness when they see it. They just sit on the sidelines and sulk. They want to play the game of, you know, who has the best looking robes, the longest tassels, or what have you. But Jesus is, is trying to pull them into something different, something better, and actually seeking God. Sounds like nothing much changes. Sounds like nothing much changes. It's so true. Holiness comes in very different packages. Jesus and John are very different from one another, yet very holy. It's not their food or clothes or lifestyle. It's not their, their job or their worldly importance. It's not their age or gender or race or what have you that signify holiness. Jesus says it's whether they bear good fruit. He says wisdom is justified by her deeds. Do you remember Proverbs 8, Lady Wisdom? Wisdom has laid out her table. Does this ring a bell to any of you that went through the wisdom literature? It's a whole chapter where you've got wisdom personified as a woman. In this passage, Jesus is talking as though he were the character of wisdom from Proverbs 8, which in fact he is. He's saying that he is wisdom incarnate, and he is justified by his deeds. We'll come back to that in a moment. You'll see why. We're going to go now to one of the most loved passages in the Gospels, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wonderful passage. Let's, uh, let's open it up. What's the image here? Two oxen hooked up together to the same plow, wearing the same yoke on their shoulders. That's us and Jesus. We walk side by side with Jesus, and with him, we get the job done. Guess who's doing most of the work? Jesus. But he gives us the dignity of working alongside him for the salvation of the world. All we have to do is stay next to him and keep walking. What's the Old Testament reference? Because in Matthew, just about every passage has an Old Testament reference, or five. Turn in your Bibles to Sirach, chapter 51, verses 26 to 27. This is the character of wisdom speaking. Put your neck under the yoke and let your souls receive instruction. It is to be found close by. See with your eyes that I have labored little and found for myself much rest. Wisdom says, her yoke is light, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus appropriates these words. He's saying, that's me. I am the yoke you should take on yourself. I am the one that gives your soul rest. I am wisdom incarnate. And you know, you know the song, Eyes on the Prize? I put my hand to the gospel plow. I won't take nothing for the journey now. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. I had that in my head the whole time I was writing this. <laughs> All right, anything you want to share so far? Or should we go back to Matthew? All right, back to Matthew. Okay, so what's the context sense for this passage in Matthew? Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Well, in the very next passage, Jesus confronts the Pharisees about their rigid and unbiblical Sabbath regulations. The Pharisees want to pile heavy burdens on people. They've got the burdensome yoke. They even want to make the day of rest burdensome. Jesus actually wants to give us rest. A life of love, joy, and peace here on earth and eternal rest in heaven. So there's the context. Jesus is comparing his yoke to the the yoke of the Pharisees. And what's the application for us? Well, the yoke of the Pharisees is heavy. And there's another yoke that's heavy, the yoke of sin. The yoke of sin is heavy. The problem with lying is that you have to remember everything you said to everyone and keep it all straight. The problem with gossip is that you hope all the things you said about everyone don't come back around to them. Sin isn't easy. Sin is a burden. Jesus wants to lift that burden. Living with integrity makes your soul free. So, Jesus says, walk with me. 
I've got the light path. He says, don't worry, don't be afraid, come with me, find rest for your soul. In chapter 12, the Pharisees accuse Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. This is a great story. Let's read chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All right. This is a really dense passage, am I right? Oh, yeah, it's really dense. There's a lot going on here, and it's not easy to understand, but it's really fun. Because Jesus is saying a lot in very few lines. That's why I threw it right over their heads. That's why, yeah. Let's unpack it. First, were the disciples actually breaking the law of Moses? Well, the book of Deuteronomy does forbid harvesting grain on the Sabbath, as in grabbing a scythe and putting in a full day's work. But the Pharisees chose to interpret that strictly, so that even picking the head off a stalk of wheat was forbidden. And normally, they're the religious leaders. They have the authority to make that call. Jesus says later on in Matthew, they sit in the seat of Moses. But Jesus' reply to the Pharisees is brilliant. Jesus denies them the authority to make that call over him and his disciples. He begins with the perfect Old Testament smackdown. What's this story about David? Anyone remember this story about David? It's been a while, huh? Yeah. And it's a bit of an obscure story. All right. Let's see. David is running for his life from King Saul, but nobody knows it yet. He's on the run, he's a fugitive, and he runs to the priests of Nob for help and shelter with a few of his followers that have come with him. And there at Nob, you had a community of priests who it seems had the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant set up there at the time, and they were conducting the rituals of, of worship and temple service. David shows up there, all, uh, all out of breath, looking really messy, looking really hot and sweaty. And he says to the priest there, I'm trying to remember his name, Ahimelech, he says to Ahimelech, I need bread and I need a sword. And Ahimelech says, well, we don't have any food. And David says, well, I'm on this mission. It's a really important mission, and I didn't have any time to, to grab food or weapons or anything before I left. It's this mission for Saul, more or less. We need food. And Ahimelech says, well, we have no food. There's just, there's just the holy bread in the, in the tabernacle. You know, this is the bread that only the priests can eat. And David says, that'll do. <laughs> and Ahimelech says, well, there, there's just one proviso. You and all of your followers have to have abstained from sexual relations for three days. And David says, oh, yeah, always. <laughs> and Ahimelech gives them the bread. And then David says, and I need a sword. Do you have a sword? And Ahimelech says, well, we're a community of priests. But we do happen to have one sword. It's funny enough, it's the sword of Goliath. You know, we keep it on our wall here as a, as a trophy of, of how God is protecting his people. And David says, great, I'll take it. So Ahimelech gives him the sword of Goliath 
and some loaves of bread, and David and his followers make for the hills. Then one of Saul's men, as it turns out, witnessed, the, witnessed David coming into the, the priest's compound, and he saw what happened. His name was Doug. Doug went to Saul and informed on David. Saul brings an army to Nob and slaughters all the priests of God for aiding and abetting an enemy of the state. That's 85 priests dead. David escapes. Jesus uses this story to make multiple points. First, Jesus asks the Pharisees, are you saying David offended God when he ate the holy bread? The story never implies that. God provided for David when he was hungry and in need. And God is providing for these disciples too. They walk through a field, food is in front of them, they are hungry. It is natural and right that they should eat it. But also Jesus is using the story typologically where every Old Testament character has a New Testament fulfillment. Jesus is of course the new David the rightful anointed king. Jesus' disciples are David's followers who were hungry. So, who were the Pharisees in this story? <laughs> Tell me. Doug. The Pharisees are Doug. They're the sniveling informer who wants God's anointed king dead. The Pharisees are scholars of the law. They can't have missed this point. Jesus goes on to say, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and they're guiltless. And something greater than the temple is here. Jesus is strongly implying that he and his disciples are priests, that they're a new priesthood. The old one is becoming obsolete. Jesus is saying flat out that he is greater than the temple. The temple is becoming obsolete. What happens to all the priests in the David story after the sniveling informer Doug turns David in? They all die. <laughs> Jesus is warning that the same thing is about to happen here. He's looking ahead to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's going to be the end of the Levitical priesthood. See how these two stories really tie into each other? Now, thinking back to 1st and 2nd Samuel, the David story, God was always supposed to be Israel's king, but God let Samuel appoint a king for the people because of the hardness of their heart. God was always supposed to be Israel's dwelling place. The temple, as grand as it was, was provisional. It was temporary. But now Jesus has come. He is king. He is temple. He is God. And to make his point, Jesus finishes with the line, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. There is only one Lord of the Sabbath, God. God created the Sabbath back in Genesis chapter 1. Jesus is strongly implying here that he is God, <coughs> that he created the Sabbath. And the Pharisees have no authority over him and over his new priesthood. Any thoughts? It, funny enough, they, they end up meaning very similar things. The son of man sounds like a lowly title. You know, oh, I'm a poor son of man. I'm a sinner. That's not what he's saying at all when he says son of man. It's actually a very exalted title. It comes from the book of Daniel. Daniel says that the son of man will come on the clouds in glory. He is the one to whom God has given all blessing, honor, glory, and might. That's the Son of Man. Jesus is saying, that's me. And then the Son of God, then, I mean, is, is Jesus' role in the Trinity. He's the Son of the Father. That one's more obvious. But Son of Man is a Daniel reference. His listeners would have understood that. And it was a very exalted title. So, what are some more lessons to, to pull out of this great story? That God makes the moral law. But God is not a legalist. Matthew goes on to say here, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. He's quoting Isaiah, 
God is not looking for nitpicky reasons to bring us down. That's Doug. That's the Pharisees. That's Satan the accuser. Satan the accuser is the one that wants to, to bring God's followers down. God wants to save us. God wants to empower us. God wants to equip us. God wants to give us bread and a sword like he did David. The bread of his presence, the Eucharist, and the sword of his spirit, the Bible. He wants to be our help and defender when we are in need, like he helped David when he was in need. God loves us like he loves David. The Pharisees do not learn the lesson. They keep they keep literally, at that moment, following Jesus around, looking for more ways to bring him down. You'd think after hearing that speech from Jesus, they would either repent or run. They're relentless. Jesus walks through the grain field into a synagogue and sees a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees say, uh-uh-uh, we know what you want to do. You can't heal on the Sabbath. Jesus says, if your sheep falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull it out? How much more important is a human being? Of course it is right to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus heals the man. Do the Pharisees repent? No. They seethe, and they start plotting how to destroy him. Up until this point, first you saw the Pharisees grumbling about him. Then you saw the Pharisees saying he's of the devil. And now you've got the Pharisees actively plotting to destroy him. What can we do to bring this man down before he brings us down? So what does this story about Jesus healing the withered hand tell us about the character of God? Well, God never makes laws to keep us down like the Pharisees did. God only wants to teach us the best way to live. He always wants what's best for us. Secular society paints God as some oppressive overlord who wants to keep people down with his arbitrary rules. That's not God. That's the Pharisees. God desires human freedom and human flourishing. The early church father, St. Irenaeus, said the glory of God is man fully alive. God wants to help us be the best version of ourselves. You know, I would say I see a parallel between the Pharisees and how those rules and regulations are sometimes applied by people in the Catholic Church. I know some very grace-loving, faith-filled Catholics, and I also know some very legalistic Catholics who don't just love who don't just love holiness or love righteousness, but who love lording the rules over other people. Uh, does that does that sound right to you? Yeah. And, and when we take delight in lording the rules over other people, that's when we step into Pharisee territory. I, I always wonder if, if hermits living in the wilderness, like St. Anthony of Egypt, you know, did they make it to Mass every Sunday? Don't think so. so exactly. exactly. All right, let's see. In the next story, Jesus casts out demons. The people are astonished and say, can this be the son of David? What person in the Old Testament cast out demons? David. When he played his harp and sang for Saul, he drove the demons away. There was also an extra-biblical Jewish tradition that Solomon had great power over the demons. This, the Jews then expected that the son of David would have the power to cast out demons. And some of them hoped Jesus just might be the Messiah. But the Pharisees say, once again, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus has two replies. First, he quotes Abraham Lincoln, a house divided against itself cannot stand. <laughs> Satan isn't casting out demons. Second, Jesus warns the Pharisees that they are at serious risk of committing the unforgivable sin. What is the unforgivable sin? The Holy Spirit. Right. And what does that mean? It is committing a terrible sin against God, but God forgives all kinds of terrible sins against him. What's this one? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is attributing the work of God to Satan. And that's what the Pharisees are doing here. We could also say it's, it's persistent disbelief 
in Jesus, his message, his works, despite all this evidence to the contrary that the Pharisees have been getting. This, this persistent disbelief amounts to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You're saying God isn't God. You can't recognize him when he's right in front of you. Jesus urges the Pharisees to recognize good fruit and bear good fruit, not to tear down the kingdom of God. Then the Pharisees ask for a sign. Well, if you're really who you say you are, give us a sign. Can you do a miracle? Yet Jesus has given them dozens of signs that he is the Messiah, and there's no reason one more should make a difference. So he gives them the sign of Jonah. He says that he will spend three days in the belly of the earth before rising again. He foretells his death and resurrection, basically says, wait for it. He says to them, don't you get it? Something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Solomon is here. I'm your Messiah. These Syrians, they repented of the preaching of Jonah. The Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Unless you repent at your final judgment, there will be a large crowd of ancient Assyrians plus the Queen of Sheba looking at you and saying, you idiots. <laughs> it's a really striking image. That is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our final judgments turn out better than that. So here's a question. Why does Matthew keep showing us good Gentiles, the people of Nineveh who repented, the Queen of Sheba, and hard-hearted Jews, the Pharisees? It's not because every Gentile loved Jesus or every Jew rejected him. It's because Matthew's gospel is the gospel to the Jews. Matthew is trying to shake them up. He wants them to understand it's not enough to be Jewish. It's not enough to be God's chosen people. It's not enough to know what is right. You have to actually follow Jesus. That's also a message for the church today. It's not enough to be Catholic. It's not enough to be God's chosen people. It's not enough to know what is right. We have to actually follow Jesus. Our baptisms have the power to forgive sins through the Holy Spirit. But then we're called to live out those baptismal promises. We have to be for him, not against him. We work alongside Jesus, and we build the kingdom of God. Any thoughts? All right. Am I really going to do the parables of the kingdom in five minutes? You know what? I'm going to take a vote. We can do the parables of the kingdom now and probably take about 10 minutes. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. Eat dinner? No rush. All right. What's the alternative? What's the alternative? We go through a really insane amount of material next week. All right. Let's do it. In chapter 13, Jesus begins to teach the people parables about the kingdom of heaven that we're probably quite familiar with, I think. I think this is some of the more familiar material in the Gospel of Matthew. Why does Jesus teach in parables? To make it easy for uh, the average Joe to understand. You know, it's, it's funny. He, he kind of says the opposite. He, he says it's to make it hard for some people to understand and, and easy for others. Because oh, oh here I I got the answer for this written down. Or do you want to take it? You wanted them to last forever. Yes, you wanted them to last forever. Stories stick in our heads, don't they? Well, here's what he says. The disciples came to him and said, "Why do you speak to, to them in parables?" And he answered them, "To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given." Which means it's locked. So, here's what I got written down. Why does Jesus teach in parables? Partly because he's being persecuted. Parables are how you preach truth to power. Think of the prophet Nathan calling out King David for adultery with the parable of the stolen sheep. Right. Parables are how you preach truth to power. Right. It's hard for the Pharisees to arrest Jesus for telling stories about 
planting seeds and growing wheat. What are they supposed to say? He's telling stories about planting seeds and I don't think he likes us. <laughs> Jesus says his disciples will understand the secrets of the kingdom, but many will see but not see and hear but not hear the Pharisees. And then finally, a parable sticks in people's minds. It's got layers of depth to unpack. People can ponder them over and over. We'll ponder them in about five minutes. The parable of the sower. The kingdom of heaven is like a sower who went out to sow. The seed fell on the rocky path and the birds devoured it. Those are the people that hear the gospel but, but don't get it, don't understand its importance, don't, don't have any, any background or inclination to accept it. The seed falls on the rocky ground and it sprouts but it lacks roots and it falls away at the first heat of the sun. It falls away at the, the first challenge. It, it doesn't have any depth. The seed falls on thorns. It grows well for a while, but in the end, it's, it's choked out by the cares of the world. It, it never flourishes. And then there are seeds that fall on good soil, and they bear good fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. The sower is Jesus, and the seed is the gospel. What's the message? Be good soil. What can we do to be good soil? Well, have roots study and understand the word, and don't let the thorns choke you out. Keep the cares of the world at bay. Give them to Jesus. The parable of the weeds and the wheat. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but an enemy sowed weeds among the wheat. His servants asked if the man wanted the weeds pulled up, and the man said, no, you would root out the wheat along with it. Let both grow together until the proper time. Then the wheat will be harvested and the weeds will be burned. Our church has weeds and wheat, saints and sinners. And I got to say, this is probably a really unpopular parable for our time and place. Jesus says, do not judge. We should not be weed pullers lest we tear the church apart. Now, does that mean that we should allow, say, predators to operate within the church? Of course not. It's our job to report them. And it's our government's job to judge them and put them where they belong. But Jesus is saying the church's job, the church's job is to be ridiculously rich in mercy. As rich in mercy as God is. Because God wants even the most evil people to repent. So we, the church, continue to hold out God's offer of salvation to everyone. We don't want to slam the door on anyone's face. We don't want to pull up wheat with weeds. Let's think about less drastic circumstances. It is so easy for, for zealous, well-meaning Catholics to get caught up in pointing the finger at one another. You didn't really go to Mass because you didn't receive the Eucharist in both species. Am I right? Don't you love that? We get these silly arguments. You know, are you a Pope Francis Catholic or a Pope Benedict Catholic? Mm. Guitar or no guitar? Latin or no Latin? How do you receive communion? We can be quick to judge. Instead of pointing fingers and pulling up wheat, let's encourage and inspire one another to go closer to God. Let's help God's church grow and leave the harvesting to him. Amen? Amen. All right, let's do one last one. Jesus asks the crowds if they understand his parables, and they say yes. Yeah. You're like, really? Jesus is pleased. He says, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. That made me smile, because that's exactly what we're doing here. Uh, think For a householder bringing out what is new and what is old, I'm thinking of someone preparing a meal at home. Okay, I just bought the spaghetti noodles. Do I have any sauce? What have I got? What have I got? <laughs> what goes together? Jesus is training us as scribes of the kingdom of heaven. We get to figure out what goes together. He wants us to be able to understand his word, to be able to teach others. He wants us to be able to bring out what is new and what is old. He wants us to understand the new covenant and the old covenant and see how they go together. And that's exactly what Matthew is doing in his gospel. And that's what we get to do so often in this class. So let's end today with a big pat on the back from Jesus. Great job. Jesus... Jesus congratulates you. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for calling and equipping us to spread your gospel. Oh God, give us opportunities to tell people about you, to share what you have done for us, to bring the good news of salvation to other people. Help us to live and love your word. Thank you that you take our worries away, that we can cast all our burdens on you. Thank you that you are a protector and defender, and you are with us always. We love you, Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. See you all next week.